Good morning, everyone. This is David Pott with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, why don't we get started today uh, for today's webinar on forecasting bull trout suitable habitat in a changing world. And uh, we will be, uh, Seth w uh, Wenger of Trout Unlimited will be presenting today, uh, accompanied by, uh, towards the end, I think Dan Isaac from the U.S. Uh, Forest Service and Jason Dunham from the USGS. Uh, in the discuss discussion phase of, of this presentation today. I, I did want to mention that this webinar is brought to you by the Northwest Climate Science Center and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I also want to thank all the organizations uh, who have contributed project support and also helped distribute this event information, including the USGS, the U.S. Forest Service, the Great Northern LCC, the North Pacific LCC, and C3. And so, Seth, uh, I just uh, want to go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, Seth is a uh, landscape ecologist with Trout Unlimited. Um, and Seth, you might want to introduce yourself a little bit more fully. And uh, thank you uh, in advance for your presentation today. Thank you, David. Um, well, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to present, and uh, both on behalf of myself and Dan and Jason, who as David mentioned, are going to be jumping in uh, for part of this presentation, and I'll ask if they, they're welcome to jump in at any time. Um, I do not consider myself a bull trout expert, but Dan and Jason have a lot more experience in this regard. This, well, okay, so uh, I'm a staff scientist with Trout Unlimited, and for the last five years I've been working with Dan, Jason, and other folks, um, and been housed over here at the Rocky Mountain Research Station and we've had some ongoing collaborations, mainly looking at the potential effects of climate change on trout distributions um, and some various spinoffs from that. And so this, what I'm discussing today, is work that recently was published in a paper in Global Change Biology. And I want to be clear that this was really a methods paper that happened to use bull trout as an example. Uh, I will be talking about what we see for bull trout, but uh, I'm going to let Dan and Jason talk a little bit more about the bi biological side of things as well as some of the potential uh, limitations of this. So I'm going to assume that most people on this call are somewhat familiar with bull trout. For those that aren't, the important thing is that this is an imperiled species, uh, federally listed in the lower 48 under the Endangered Species Act, and a species of management concern for various state and federal agencies. Significantly, the early life stages of bull trout rely on very cold water. It's one of the most stenothermic of salmonid species. And later adults, you know, will live in much warmer water and can tolerate much warmer water. But for spawning and rearing, it appears that cold water is fairly essential to this species. So naturally, climate change pre uh, presents a potential concern. If water temperatures continue to warm, then we may be losing a lot of the potential habitat for this species. So this is a critter that we want then to be able to model when a model is its occurrence under current conditions and then be able to project under future conditions. And we've used the same general approach for a number of species. Uh, and this diagram shows basically we, what we do is we use existing empirical fish data, so actual occurrences or presence and absences of the fish uh, on the landscape, and model that as a function of climatic variables, including hydrologic and temperature, as well as other landscape variables, mostly derived from GIS. Uh, these include things like stream gradient. And we also consider, in some cases, the presence of other species that are potential competitors. Now, in building the existing models, we use weather data. Uh, so the flow and temperature data are, are derived indirectly from actual observations. When we want to project into the future, we need to substitute in climate uh, projections coming out of uh, general circulation models, global change models, that have been downscaled to the region. And these run through, and for the hydrologic variables, these are being run through uh, the variable infiltration capacity model. And that's actually true both for the uh, current data, the recent historical data, and the future data. So I won't go into any detail about that, um, but that's something if you have questions about we can discuss later. Now. Any approach to projecting species distributions into climate change has a number of issues associated with it. This is that there's huge uncertainties, uh, and these are often not clearly acknowledged. 
And that was really the focus of this study, to see can we do better with this? Uh, can, you know, after accounting for uncertainty, do we still see the same patterns? We've got uncertainties within a model, so we can find a good model that seems to do a decent job of predicting a species, but there's always uncertainties in there. If we're using a traditional modeling framework, as we are, uh, we see this in the parameters. The distribution of the parameters have the standard deviation associated with them, and that represent uncertainty in the actual effect of each of these predictive variables, for example, temperature. We also are rarely confident that the model, that there is one model that accurately represents the species. It's more typical that there are a number of different models which may have different combinations of predictor variables in it that provide reasonably good fits to the data. And uh, conventionally, it's often been done that you, folks would just select the best performing model or the best supported model and use something like AIC and use that for inferences and projections. But that is ignoring the uncertainty in the model selection itself. So that's something else we want to take into account. And then there's huge uncertainty in future climate conditions. There's a lot of G, uh, different GCMs out there, well over 20 now, and they show different things, and even internally they give different results depending on initial conditions. So the old approach to doing species distribution modeling, and I'm going to give an example from work I did about three years ago. This was never published, but uh, this is a, a series of predictions for bull trout habitat suitability under current conditions. We're looking at Idaho here and Montana. So this is a portion of the interior Columbia Basin. And using the basic methods I showed, build a model for explaining the current distribution, and then project back on the landscape, say, under these current conditions, uh, which habitat, which stream segments are at least 50% suitable. And those are shown in green. And then we can project forward and say, if we have different temperatures, different flows, under future conditions, how does that look? And here's the projection we got for 2040s. Now, as I note here, you know, when I showed this to people initially, everyone's response is the same. You know, holy cow, that's terrible, and that can't be right. And it's not. It's a biased prediction. What we're missing here is that there are a lot of stream segments, among many things we're missing here, is that there's a lot of stream segments where we've got a prediction of uh, presence or habitat suitability of, say, 30%, 40%. That means it's under that 50% threshold to show up in green. But 30 to 40 percent of those stream segments actually are suitable. That's what that, that's what that means. So we've got a 25 percent suitability. That means 25 percent of such stream segments actually would support the species. So we're missing all of that in here. And so this is actually a gross underestimate of the probability purely on that. So we wanted to do a better job, incorporate that uncertainty, and incorporate as many other sources of uncertainty as we reasonably could. So here's what we did. We used a data set of 995 sites uh, in the interior of Columbia where we had presence or absences of bull trout recorded. These were data that are assembled from several uh, existing data sets from federal and state agencies. They were kind enough to share with Rocky Mountain Research Station a number of years ago, um, and we assembled into a coherent database and used for this purpose. Uh, one thing I want you to note is that you know, these are found data, as they sometimes say. Uh, we've got a lot of clustering here. Not everything has been sampled in a random manner or a, a uniform manner. And that presents a problem that we need to deal with in the modeling. The modeling method that we used is multi-level logistic regression. This is, in some senses, uh, it's based on an old school approach. Logistic regression is just conventional regression with a presence-absence response variable or a binary response variable. The multi-level is essentially just means in this case that we have a random effect for subwatershed identity. What this means is that if you look at this map here, um, for example, in this uh, map as an illustration, the red dots indicate the presence of brook trout. You notice that there's some watersheds that have brook trout and some don't. If brook trout is found in one street, in one uh, location, it's likely to be found in others. If it's not found in one, it's likely to not be found in others. So that is spatial autocorrelation. And if we don't account for that some way, it leads to bias in our models. And one legitimate way of handling that is this multi-level approach that we used. Now we identified a priori a number of potential predictor variables based on past research that might influence bull trout distributions. These are temperature, uh, 
obviously, that's an, going to be a potential important one. Winter high flow, this is the frequency of high flows in the winter. This is mainly trying to capture locations where you occasionally or frequently get rain on snow events, uh, which are hypothesized to be uh, negatively correlated with the distribution of fall spawning species. Mean flow, which is essentially a stream size, slope or gradient, and an unconfined valley bottom distance. This is uh, an unconfined valley bottom as defined here is mainly in higher moderate to higher elevation areas, uh, broad open valleys where we get uh, more, uh, a lot of connect, uh, connectivity among the stream with um, adjacent areas, essentially beaver activity. These are hypothesized to be, and have been shown to be good habitats for a number of trout species that are preferred over, say, a canyon. It's not always true. Uh, and then we use brook trout, which is hypothesized to be a competitor to bull trout. Now I want to go ahead and jump to this figure here, which is showing the response of bull trout to air temperature and winter high flow frequency, which are two main climatic uh, variables, and comparing that to the response for other trout species from similar studies we've done. So the black line here shows that's bull trout. And looking here on the panel on the left, we see that the probability of bull trout occurring as a function of air temperature. Uh, and you see that is by far the coldest thermal niche of any of the trout species that we've looked at. Cutthroat trout is shown in green. Uh, it's got a similar niche to brook trout, shown in blue. Rainbow trout is a little warmer. Brown trout uh, is the warmest. And that's consistent with past studies. Over here on the right, we see the response of these different species to the frequency of high flows in the winter. And we see that our three fall spawning species all show a negative response, as hypothesized. But the most extreme one is for bull trout. So this does show a pretty substantial, this is again based on empirical relationships of species presence absence to these predictor variables in models that also include other variables. And we do see that there is a pretty strong climatic relationship here. So. Now, under these new methods where we're trying to deal with these additional sources of uncertainty in the model. The first kind of uncertainty we have is a within model uncertainty. That includes parameter uncertainty as well as the residual error. The latter is a little bit complex, and I'll come back to that towards the end. There's a Hmong model uncertainty, the probability that we've got the correct model. And then there's the future climate uncertainty. Taking each of these in turn, within model uncertainty, is essentially the uncertainty in, e in the, each of the parameter estimates. When we perform regression, we get a mean estimate, but we also get a standard error on that estimate. And normally what we do when we do predictions is we simply use the mean, which is our best guess estimate for that. But we could, oh, there it is, we could consider the uncertainty in that. So we could be making predictions by drawing randomly from the potential values. Uh, this is centered on the mean estimate for summer mean flow, but this shows that distribution, the probability distribution for what that parameter could be. It could be as low as, you know, near zero. It could be as high as close to two. Taking into account uncertainty, well, it should add a lot of uncertainty into our predictions as well. So that's one source. Second and slightly more complex one is the uncertainty among models. So this shows our whole list of candidate models for bull trout. This is an early model screening. These were shown to be the best. The next column over, AUC, this is the area under the curve of the receiver operator characteristic plot. Uh, that's a big mouthful of words. By and large, it just means how good the model predictions are. Higher number is better. The problem we have here is that, you know, it's clear that this model performs better than the model below it but only by a few points. How much better is that really? What we would like to do is to be able to turn that into a weight for those who use AIC, Aki Information Criterion. Uh, you may be familiar with developing model weights from those. We want something analogous here that's based on this performance measure that we used. And to get that, we actually we resurrected an old technique that's buried in the statistical literature, which essentially involves making a whole bunch of replicate versions of our data set via bootstrapping. And for every replicate data set, we 
test each of these models and see which one is the best. And every time one's selected as best, that's a kind of a vote in its favor. We do that many, many times. We get a percentage of time that each is selected as best. That is our model weight. Uh, so it works really well. It's not hard to do. Uh, we're, no one does this, but we're going to be publishing. I'm working with a statistician colleague to publish a paper uh, in the ecological literature to you know, point this method out and show how it can be used. It's particularly valuable for those who use models like, um, not like these, but things like boosted regression trees, other models that can only be evaluated based on performance. So this is the only valid method we know to get these kind of model weights, which are really needed if you're going to do the kind of uncertainty analysis that we're doing. Finally, we've got future climate uncertainty. Every GCM agrees that things are going to warm up. There's big disagreement among the models and even within the models on how much. In terms of precipitation, uh, you know, the distressing thing is that I've learned over the last few years is that climatologists still can't predict precipitation at all. So we've got some pro uh, projections that things are going to get wetter, some things are going to get drier, changes in the timing of the precipitation. That's still very unclear. So we've got lots of these different models which give us very different predictions. What do we do about that? In our case, we had a limited number of projections available to us. These came from the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. And we wanted data sets that were uh, connected to the uh, VIC, the Variable Infiltration Capacity Flow Model. And so we had limited um, options there. We chose three, working with SIG, we chose three data sets. One is a composite, an ensemble of multiple GCMs. And then two others kind of bracket the range of reasonable projections for the region. One is the warmest predicting, one's the coolest prediction, predicting. And we used all three of these to make our predictions. So how do we actually do this? Well, it's essentially just a Monte Carlo approach where we're taking random draws of accounting for all these different sources of uncertainty. First, we randomly select a model that's dealing with our model selection uncertainty. We do that based on those weights we just showed. Then from that model, we randomly draw parameter estimates from the distribution for each of those parameters. It's not quite as simple as that. We need to take into account the correlation among those parameters, so we're drawing from a multivariate normal distribution across all those parameters, but it's actually quite simple to do in practice. For forecast, then we randomly draw one of these three climate scenarios. We weighted the ensemble ones higher than the two bracketing ones, since that seems to be the best guess. We gave that 50% weight, and each of the bracketing scenarios, 25% weight. And from that, we've got all these elements here that we make a prediction. We make that prediction at every stream segment across the full range. And then we do that at least 10,000 times. In our case, we did it 50,000 times. Uh, just the computer's doing all the work, so it's just a matter of how long you want to wait for it to finish. But you can do that in a few hours. Now, what you get out of this, then, is a distribution of predictions at every single stream segment. So this shows, this figure here shows two different stream segments. Um, the top three panels is one stream segment. The top left is the estimation of our probabilities of the species occurring. Just a histogram here, under current conditions. So we see there's, it's most likely that it occurs with high um, probability. So this is actually a fairly suitable stream segment for it, um, probably mid-elevation to a slightly upper elevation. But there's a whole lot of uncertainty depending on what you, uh, what assumptions are going in here, which model is selected, and what the parameter estimates are. It's kind of all over the map. If we start looking at projections under future climate conditions, we see that we, this big shift, where now it's very unlikely to be a highly suitable location, it's much more likely to be very unsuitable, but still a whole lot of uncertainty there. As we get to the 2080s, that uncertainty gradually starts to disappear, and almost all the weight goes on to this uh, very low occurrence probability. In other words, this becomes a highly unsuitable location. The lower panel shows another stream that's just selected and as an example that's currently highly suitable for bull trout. We're very confident that this is a good place to, to live as a bull trout. Um, now, when we go to 2040s, we still it's still reasonably good, but we start to get a lot of uncertainty. By the 2080s, 
now we're starting to put most of the weight again on the low probability. But there's still a whole lot of noise here. There's still a lot of uncertainty in the models as to whether it's going to be good or bad. And a lot of that depends on what climate uh, scenario turns out to be true. So how does this look graphically on the landscape? Um, what we can do with these, you know, looking back at these histograms, for each one of these, the best guess probability is simply the mean probability, which in you know, the one I'm pointing at here, you know, comes out probably around 60-some percent. So we can take that mean for every segment and map it. The darker blues are higher probabilities. Those are close to 90% and above. The kind of bluish greens here are intermediate, are 50% and grading down to lighter greens, low percentages, and white is close to zero. So you, uh, for anyone familiar with this area, we're basically just tracking elevation for the most part. But you also do see this uh, phenomenon of suitable habitat extending downstream. Now I need to point out, we excuse me, did not mo model large streams. We did not model rivers. Uh, we did not have flow projection, projections for those rivers. And so we did not use fish data from those rivers. So that means that a lot of what most of the data we're using to model are juveniles or adults that are in spawning locations. And that, so it's fair to infer that what we're projecting here is suitability of habitat for spawning and rearing as opposed to adult suitability. Okay, so that's the recent historical mean projection. This is the mean projection for the 2040s. So we still see we're losing a lot. We're losing a lot of the high probabilities, except for you know, up here in Glacier, uh, down in Sawtooth. But by and large, we're losing a lot of that high uh, occurrence probability. So we don't have confident. There's not many locations that are confident the species is it's still suitable for the species. But a lot of locations where it could be. Moving to the 2080s, sadly, we get to mostly very, very low probabilities of occurrence, except in the highest elevation locations, where it's you know, low to moderate. Now, we could also be more optimistic. We can take other slices out of that distribution. We can look at, in this case, for example, the 97 and a half percentile here. So this is kind of a best case scenario or close to it for the species, where this would imply that the climate doesn't warm as much as it could, so the lower predicting, the warmer or cooler predicting GCMs are the more correct ones, and that the models that are that show the least response to climate are the most are the ones that turn out to be true. If all that happens that way, then this is a this is a possibility that we could be preserving still by the 2040s a lot of uh, a fair amount of decent habitat, and even by the 2080s a moderate amount of a somewhat suitable habitat for the species. So, but based on these data, that does represent close to a best case scenario for this region. Now, how does it look in terms of total stream length? Each of these histograms is showing, uh, it's out of, after running this 50,000 times, every time we did one of these realizations, we added up the stream, total suitable stream length associated with that. So this top panel shows recent historical conditions. And we see that on the average, we've got an estimate of around 35,000 kilometers of suitable habitat for bull trout under current conditions. But it could be as low as you know somewhere in the 20s or up in the mid 40s. Even the 2040 scenarios, we see a big decrease in the mean, but it's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of how much total habitat there is. We also start to see these distinct humps that correspond to the different uh, different climate data sets that were used. Those become more pronounced down here in the 2080s, where all the projections are saying it's highly likely that we have less than 10,000 kilometers of suitable stream length, but depending on which climate data set, projected climate data set is you look at, you get different results. The warmest predicting is very close to, you know, it's less than 1,000, 2,000 uh, kilometers of suitable habitat. The ensemble is here, and then this is the coolest predicting one, which is substantially more. If we want to look at sources of uncertainty, um, let me walk you through this. What we did was, for every one of these, the historic, recent historical, the 2040s and 2080s, we uh, looked at the total amount of uncertainty in the, the full model, kind of everything, and then we recalculated it, leaving out um, one or more sources of uncertainty. So 
we look at the uncertainty under historical conditions, that's just due to that parameter uncertainty, that kind of within model uncertainty, that's a fair bit of it. If we ignore parameter uncertainty and just look at model uncertainty, that's also pretty substantial. And then those two combine to do this. So there's basically overlap in that uncertainty, and that's expected. Looking into the 2040s, we see that model uncertainty starts to become relatively small. Um, parameter uncertainty is still, is still uh, pretty significant, but climate uncertainty really is dominating the uncertainty here. And that is even more true, or at least as true in the 2080s as well. So the climate uncertainty that are our biggest sources of uncertainty in the future, um, which, is, which is not a complete surprise. Now I want to start moving on to caveats here, and I'll let Dan and Jason talk in a minute. Um, but I just want to point out, we've recently, thanks to a project that Dan Isaac is heading up, um, are now have available to us good estimates of stream temperature. Um, at all these stream segments across the region. This is going to be expanded to cover the whole Northwest. This is the Northwest Stream Temperature Project. So we can now start to, rather than use air temperature as a surrogate, we can start to say, well, how does it look for stream temperature? We know that air temperature is a very imperfect surrogate for stream temperature, and it may be that we don't see quite as significant of a response when we actually look at water temperatures. So here I'm comparing from the best model on the left is the probability of occurrence as a function of air temperature, and we see that steep decline. Here we see the same thing for using stream temperature now. There's a slightly different data set that includes even more fish collections, uh, but the response is actually slightly steeper. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to see a different story when we move to stream temperature, but it's very preliminary. We just did this analysis last week, so um, there may be something more to look at. But there are some caveats that are really important to mention. I feel very good about the methods we used. Um, good about the models we developed. It's still, these are still just models. Importantly, one thing that's not immediately clear by the results I showed is that is the residual error. So anytime we've got a projection, say, of 30% occurrence probability, that's like a prediction of absence with a 30% error rate. So when we're predicting, that means so a whole lot of places that we're predicting that bull trout is not. It actually is. And those we can't predict where they are across the landscape, but in fact, with the modeling, we assume they're semi-random. But a lot of those are likely to be, you know, anomalously cold locations, a lot of them probably because they're receiving good inputs of groundwater. Those very well could persist in the future and not warm as much as we project. So we're missing that, and there's not at present with our data sets, we don't have a good way to represent that. So in that case, we're being pessimistic. Secondly, it's been shown, um, and Charlie Luce will have a paper coming out on this soon, it's now in revision, that cold streams warm more slowly than warm streams. This is partly because at high elevation, these streams receive, even through most of the summer, a lot of their water inputs through snow melt, through um, snow fields that are drifts that persist through most of the summer in some cases from glacier or from cold kind of uh, semi-frozen groundwater high elevations. So they're getting cold water. They are not nearly as sensitive to increases that you see in the surrounding air temperature. And we at present do not account for this um, variable sensitivity. And finally, we completely ignored uh, potential management actions. We did not consider offsetting management actions. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dan um, and to Jason to kind of discuss a little bit further their thoughts on this. They were part of this project from the beginning, and I think I've painted a fairly pessimistic viewpoint, and they may be able to talk a little bit about some sources of optimism, I hope. Thank Dan? you, Seth. Oh, Jason, go ahead. No, this is David. I just wanted to thank you so for that. Yeah. Um, and for Jason out there, Jason, I need your user, your call-in user number so I can unmute your line on this end. If you'll send that to me on chat. So we may want to start with Dan. Oh, uh, I think Seth did a great job. He was, um, you know, spearheaded that whole approach. It was really his brainchild, and, and it, it adds a lot of nuance and additional detail, I think, that, that's useful to think about to a lot of the bioclimatic model predictions. Um, you know, in 2007, the, the Riemann et al. paper 
was published that that kind of treated a lot of this stuff more homogeneously than, than um, Seth is treating it. And so it's really nice to go look at and think about those maps and that in some places you may be more or less confident in, in, in the results that you're anticipating to see. Um, you know, one of the additional caveats Building on on some of the things that Seth said, though, is, is is you know these are model predictions, and, and one of the big things that we're missing right now, or we don't really know, uh, have a good handle on, is how fast the fish may or may not actually be responding to these sorts of projections. So, um, you know, we've been predicting for a long time that bad things are going to happen to fish distributions, sensitive species from climate change, but we haven't done a good job really of going back to revisit historical fish survey sites where the species occurred um, to see if they're still there and, and determine whether or not they're, they're tracking these um, predictions that, that the models can make. And I think, you know, to me, that's, that's really where we need to be thinking about going is actually starting to try to do some of the um, Field survey works to do the biological validation and get a better sense of, of how confident we can be in, in these sorts of predictions. And that's that's really all I had. I don't know if, if Jason's now available to be added to the conversation. You know, I'm having trouble unmuting Jason's line, <laughs> identifying him here. We have. Let me just go ahead and. Uh, I'll go ahead and unmute all, so I would ask that folks on your end, if you're not uh, speaking, if you could mute your line, uh, that would be great. And am I on? Jason, I, uh, you should be live, so go ahead. I'm here now? Yep, we can hear Okay, you. great. Um, yeah, I just uh, wanted to echo, I guess, um, what Seth and Dan um, already said. I think the slide that we're looking at now kind of tells the story um, I think one of the most important things is that, um, you know, these kinds of projections don't evaluate um, what we can do about uh, climate in streams. And, you know, there's some work uh, going on right now with a, a student of Steve Wanzell's in the Middle Fork of the John Day River that shows that, um, you know, if you restore uh, riparian shading, that you can cool streams about three or four times more than they would heat based on any kind of climate scenario that we'd look at. So uh, that's not going to be the case everywhere uh, we look on the landscape, but there are definitely some really important sort of local opportunities to do something about climate. We're not just going to sit here and, you know, let it happen. So. And I have a question from Judy. Um, so Judy's asking if uh, Seth uh, will be augmenting this work with any of uh, Jason's patch work where, uh, Jason, you're, you're going through a project of mapping potential suitable habitat at a more refined scale potentially. Uh, so either for Jason or for Seth, you know, is there a possibility of, of kind of updating this approach with, uh, and Jason, you may want to explain your, your um, kind of mapping of potential suitable habitat projects. Um, sure, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, so we're following behind um, Dan and Seth's um, water temperature predictions from the Norwest effort and using uh, those mapped uh, predictions of August stream temperatures to um, uh, map out where uh, patches of, of uh, cold water are for bull trout across the landscape. So that'll give us um, a patch-based view of where uh, the species is uh, currently persisting. So it's a little bit different than some of the models that Seth is using now that are based on uh, points in the landscape. So he, he's dealt with some of the issues um, with some of the random effects in his models, but with the patches we'll be able to be more explicit about um, uh, where bull trout are and, and look at uh, presence and sort of the scale that um, is important. We're not sure what that critical patch size is going to be. It's probably going to vary from place to place, but it'll really help sort of refine our view of um, where fish are more likely to persist um, in the future, if that makes any sense. Yeah, Judy, did, did you have any follow-up on that? You can go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just, as I was listening to Seth uh, give his talk, I was just thinking 
boy, wouldn't it be great to have those predicted patches um, to make a comparison to so that when you're making the prediction of the the patches that we have present then, it looks kind of gloomy. But if we had another, another prediction of your uh, potential patches, maybe there's some adjacent habitat that might also be maintained through the future that might uh, clump up that habitat more. Well, this is Seth. Uh, we actually included everything in there. We did not limit this to the current known distribution. We looked at suitable habitat throughout the whole that whole basin uh, under current and future conditions. So we're actually it's actually a little broader than what we would see if we used Jason's forthcoming patches, which would constrain it somewhat. Um, well, not really. Actually, come to think of it, I think it's actually going to be pretty similar. But it, we we did we did include pretty much everything and just evaluated across the whole region suitability. So um, confining it to patches wouldn't really change the fundamental results we're seeing. Uh, that said, you know the project that Jason's doing is, you know that that'll be the basis for you know the best basis we all have I think for understanding um, what's happening with bull trout in the future. And so excited to work with him on that and help it any way we can. Great. Any any other uh, questions? Uh, the lines are open, so please feel free. Uh, hi, this is Rowan Baker. Um, that uh, slide, uh, Seth, where you showed the difference between when you're using air temperature versus actual water temperature, looked like there were some pretty dramatic differences. If you know, at the at the low end, I wanted I wondered if you would, guys would maybe mention. I had heard um, Jason talk a little bit about using um, using a 13 degree centigrade cutoff, and I don't remember whether that was air or water temperature. But if you could just talk about the implications, maybe of of the occurrence probability on the right versus the left, that would help. I think. One, this is Seth. One important caveat with that is that stream temperature increases slower than air temperature, so it is steeper on the right. Um, but if we look at projections in the future, we might expect, you know, a three, three and a half degree increase in air temperature over the next, you know, 70 years, but only a, you know, one and a half, you know, two degree uh, increase in stream temperature. So in that sense, I, you know, I haven't done a, a real, you know, any kind of rigorous comparison, but they're maybe fairly comparable in terms of uh, the response there. I, I think and, it, and is that... Are you look are you thinking of that I mean that's a really good answer, but I'm wondering that's sort of like maybe a static view, but over time with some of the climate projections and including the downscale projections, um, you know, things get pretty dry in certain places on the landscape and, and you know in any case I'm I'm kind of wondering if there's a, a more holistic view of kind of the progression of the air temperature, stream temperature relationship. I'm going to let Dan Isaac take a crack at that because he's one who leads the Norwest project and knows more about that than me. Uh, well, one of the things that we've seen in some of the previous papers that we published on stream temperature, um, where we've got, and there aren't very many places like this, but in the places where we've got good long term monitoring records, then you can make a regression model that predicts stream temperature from air temperature and discharge. Usually you can predict the variability in in-stream temperatures pretty well from those. And if you do the attribution analysis to understand which of those two things causes most of the variability in stream temperatures, is it driven by discharge, is it driven by air temperature? The vast majority of the variability is driven by the changes in air temperature. And so discharge sometimes exacerbates um, stream temperature increases but not all the time, and the effect isn't necessarily that strong. I, I would um, suggest that, that the changes in discharge from a biological perspective are probably going to be most important, um, at least during the summertime, in terms of just how they're um, gradually reducing the volume of habitat that's available for the fish, because the general trend has been toward um, lower base flows during the summer, and so, so there's just less habitat area out there, and that's going to force competitive interactions and, and fighting for food and, and, and other things. So 
So I don't, I guess I'm less convinced, at least in the systems that we've studied and what we've seen so far, that um, discharge is going to be a player in, in the temperature um, game. But, Thanks but for back that. to your, your earlier point too, Rowan, I think about um, the, the temperature cutoff and you look at those curves, um, I, I think that's a, that's a really important thing to think about because you know, what is a critical temperature? Um, because that's going to um, be where and how you delimit your habitat distribution for different um, critters or different life stages. And so I think we're getting to that point now and, and actually we've been working on this, Seth and I, a little bit with some of these big fish databases about trying to combine um, the biological information with temperature maps to, to develop thermal niche criteria based on thousands and thousands of sites. And, and depending on which site stage you look at, depending on which species you look at, you're going to have a different cutoff value or probability associated with that. And, and um, picking one number sometimes chops the world up into a yes, no sort of world when actually as, as you know, we're seeing in the, in the accounting of probabilities that Seth is doing, you know, it, there's a lot more shades of gray out there. So, so there's um, more to think about in terms of, of, you know, how we interpret some of these temperature curves. Yeah, this is Jason. I think we've got job security there. Um, you know, uh, I haven't had a chance to look at the uh, the data um, for the figure on the right hand side here where that came from, but. Um, you know, we published our stuff in 2003, looking at uh, probability of occurrence of bull trout and temperature. Um, you do get a different view, um, so that's stuff that we've got to um, talk through and figure out. You know, why we're seeing different patterns in different data sets. Um, I think also um, worth pointing out is some work by Matt Mesa uh, using bioenergetics types of approaches to, um, you know, look at um, what temperatures bull trout would grow best at given different levels of food. And this is stuff that's also shown by Jason Seelong with some physiological work uh, up in uh, Bozeman uh, back in 2001. Uh, you know, bull trout can grow um, the fastest at 15 degrees Celsius if they have unlimited food. So um, they usually have limited food in the field, so the optimal growth temperature is probably a little bit lower. But that just points out that, you know, from a biological standpoint alone, not even a, a statistical, that there's a couple of degrees of wobble um, in that relationship that we'd expect to see. And Jason, this is David. Are, are these uh, and Seth? Are these temperatures? Are, are we looking at the August mean here? Or oh yes, very good point. We are looking at the August mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is Steve Klein. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I had a question for any of the presenters, and it and it relates to this notion of uh, monitoring for fish response. And traditionally, we've used surveys of presence, absence, but you know, is there more or more uh, definitive surveys we could do to really understand the actual uh, response to this changing climate? Yeah, I mean the. A lot of the first step in doing that is um, pulling together the, the big fish survey databases that um, have had to underpin a lot of um, building these bioclimatic models. So, so those exist. We kind of have a good idea of what species occurred where and, and when they occurred there. And, and the first step really to then figuring out how climate's affecting those is to go back and, and just revisit those sites. and. and try to replicate the methods that were used originally so the detection efficiencies stay consistent between the two. And then you just examine, um, you know, the site turnover there. Did you have an extra pay, a local extirpation or a local colonization? If you go back to a bunch of those sites, and once you understand that, then you link it to the covert. And, and you would expect that you're going to have fish species dropping out of places that are kind of towards the warm end of the thermal niche if, in fact, they're being shifted by climate change, and maybe you're going to have some new species showing up at the cold side of their thermal niche as they expand upstream. Um, and so that's kind of been the basic approach that you're starting to see in the literature. There's a good study out of France where they've done that at a national scale, and then they're seeing these shifts in, in dozens of species. Uh, Mike Young and Lisa Eby have done this with bull trout in the upper Bitterroot. And they've got a manuscript prepared there that they're, they're trying to publish. And um, 
they're seeing a, a loss of bull trout in that system. If you look over a 20-year period, um, site extirpations are three times more frequent than site colonizations, and when they link it to covariate, the things that best explain those extirpations are temperature and elevation. And so the fish, in that system at least, seem to be dropping out in the places you would expect them to be dropping out if climate change is pushing them. Thank you. And uh, for those who aren't aware, if, if uh, you are curious about some of the citations Dan mentioned, uh, you, he has a great blog called Climate Aquatics Blog, and if you uh, if you put that in your search engine, I think you'll find it there, or you can also find a link at the Rocky Mountain Research Station site. So, uh, any other uh, questions, discussion? Oh, this is Jason. I wanted to just respond to the occurrence probability question, too. I think another issue that is a little bit of a picky one that um, people need to think about a little bit is um, when you get to a, um, warmer temperatures, you may have a lower um, detectability of bull trout simply because there may be lower numbers of fish. So the chance that you're going to see something um, depends in part on uh, your capture probability, but also the number of individuals that are actually present. So um, I think in the future, you know, developing better models to handle that um, unequal detection that occurs um, would be important. Well, I'd just like to, yeah, agree with Jason on that. Um, I would really like to see the focus not be on presence absence surveys, but on, you know, repeatable quantitative abundance surveys and, and start really switching to those data in particular it would be really valuable to have a number or more sites that are sampled every year so they can see this population dynamics over time. Uh, I think that's going to be long-term critical to really being able to get better population viability estimates uh, for these and other species under different circumstances. Right, and, and monitor places where bull trout are uh, common, but also places where they're not common. Usually the long-term monitoring is from places where there's lots of bull trout because it's pretty boring to sample where there aren't that many fish. Um, this is Ron Baker again. I wanted to ask the uh, so we have all three of you on the line whether you could um, just elaborate a little bit on any thoughts you have about prioritizing work now, given you know if we were to make decisions about prioritizing where to do some restoration. Um, obviously, we'll have better information probably in the near future when these models get refined and, and when there's better information on um, you know patch distribution and, and, and presence absence, et cetera. But what do we know? Do we know enough now to start changing how to prioritize our restoration and conservation work? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, well, I was just going to say I'll, I'll throw something out so people can react to it. Uh, my view on that is that these are are really useful tools for you know looking at the species from space, getting a, a range wide view of of you know what can happen, but I think ultimately, um, you know, to make those kinds of decisions, Ron, that you're asking about, in, you know, in my opinion, uh, requires a local assessment. And, um, you know, there are, we have a lot better information uh, at a local scale that is really difficult to incorporate into these big models. So knowing um, uh, the local hydrologic processes and where streams may be more or less sensitive to climate or uh, land use, which is often a dominant driver of what we see in these streams, not necessarily just climate alone, uh, then also knowing the little things that we can't put into these models, like where are those local barriers, the water diversions, and other local human impacts. So I think it really boils down to um, using this, these big views for perspective, but ultimately it's, it's a local decision, it's a local assessment. And, and I'd echo what Jason said there, there at the end in terms of, of really needing to understand what, what the local factors are from, from a potential management response um, perspective. but. I think on the front end of that, in terms of prioritizing where you look and where you think about really trying to um, focus attention or maybe spend fewer resources, I think we're really close to being able to provide that sort of information through what Jason's doing built on top of the Norwest scenarios and in the future um, predictions that we're going to start rolling out here this winter. Um, you know, he'll have patch sizes, he'll have occurrences within um, patches of various sizes. From that, you'll get a good sense of what the cutoff is for a patch that's going to be so small that you just don't have bull trout there. 
And if, if we assume, and we're going to have to assume, that some of those relationships between patch size and occurrence are a good guide to where bull trout are going to occur in the future, we can then remap where habitat patches meet certain size criteria under future scenarios and, and look at the difference between now and then and, and start to use that to think about landscapes that may be more or less vulnerable going forward. And then if you can bring into it culvert inventories, the road inventories, other things on those landscapes that are um, impacting bull trout populations, you know, we should be able to start thinking a little more strategically about all the tactical things that we're doing right now. Hey, Dan, this is Jason. I, I think um, you might add to that, too. I'm sure you'd agree. Um, you know, we can't assume that um, we're right going into the future. So some kind of monitoring uh, in places where we expect climate to be more or less influential, just to make sure, um, you know, that um, the predictions or the observations are going the same way that we predicted, you know, just to sort of keep checking on those model predictions with measurements in the field, at least of things like water temperature or maybe uh, flow over time would be useful. Yep, absolutely. And, that, and that's where I think right now the next most logical thing to do is to be doing some big fish surveys where we go back to these historical sites because we, we can in a few years get a good sense of whether the fish are dropping out of that warm side of their thermal niche, and we can use that then to get a better estimate of how fast they're tracking climate. And, and once we've got that piece, then I think we've, we've built a whole system where we've got the, the climate models, we've got high resolution information, we've got the biological response, and, and some of those future maps then will have a, a, a better sense of how real that projection is and or whether it's gonna occur in 2040 or 2080, how fast we're gonna get there. Once we can get that biological response part, then, um, you know, this all becomes a real thing, I think. But we need to do the monitor. Great. Hey, does anyone else have, uh, we probably have time for one more question, uh, discussion point, about five till. Anyone else out there? If not, I, I had a quick question, uh, Seth. You, you mentioned uh, climate model uncertainty, especially for precipitation, with uh, squarely half of the the models showing uh, less annual precip and half showing more uh, annual precip going into the future. But uh, through the latest round of models, this has been confirmed that there's more agreement in the models uh, in terms of seasonality with drier summers, uh, more precip in the winter, which is bad for bull trout. So I was wondering if, did you take that into account? And if you were to do so, does that paint, uh, I guess, a little bit grimmer picture uh, for these fish? Well, a couple things, yeah. This was based on all these climate projections were from the previous round. So this doesn't take into account the latest generation GCMs. Um, more precip in the winter isn't bad. It's just whether that precip's in the form of rain instead of snow, that's bad. Uh, more snow in the winter is good, uh, but not everyone agrees that those climate models, even though we're seeing a little bit more consensus in some of that stuff, not everyone agrees that that's that they're getting to the correct consensus. Uh, Charlie Luce you know, recently published a paper, or he's about to publish a paper in Science that shows evidence that, in fact, uh, winter precip is on a declining trend due to uh, uh, declines in the wind speed coming across the Pacific. Uh, it's it's potentially a big deal finding. So, I'm, you know, no one's convinced that the GCMs are all, or they're really necessarily getting it right more so than in the past. I think we're just seeing a convergence in some cases, but I wouldn't, at this point, put too much stock in it. So, short answer is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> in terms of whether the new ones will really change anything or not. I'm not sure that they really will. Uh, and I certainly think the noise among them is is still massively high. So mm -hmm. I think the basic right. line of uncertainty is, stands. That's Alaska, probably. Yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, any any final questions out there? Yeah. No final questions. Hey, thanks, you guys. Uh, I really thought that was a great um, presentation. And you can sign me up for those uh, surveys, Ms. Rowan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 
Well, yes, thank you, Seth, uh, Dan, and Jason. Um, I think this really helped uh, clear up the, the paper. Uh, it was great, but there was so much behind uh, each paragraph in that paper. So really appreciate you taking the time to, to present this today. And um, uh, I did want to mention uh, it's up on the screen there, or, or it was, that the, the recording will be available on the C3 YouTube site. Uh, in a week or so, and you uh, you all can can um, uh, look at that further if if uh, if you want to review what we went through today or pass it along to others. So thank you everyone, and for the C3 members, we'll take a five minute break and uh, uh, resume our meeting on this conference line. Thank you. Keep us posted. Thank you.